Hello, thanks Hi. for having us in your place here in Vila Nova de Cerveira. I will start to ask you to tell us about your story with this place, with Enrique and with the Biennial. How did I arrive yes. to the Biennale? Well, um, I don't remember the exact year, but I arrived first time um, in the early 80s. I think the Biennale had maybe three or four, three times or something, that I think. Um, a friend of mine, which uh, studied with me in art school in London, Japanese guy, and another one, uh, Canadian guy, they, uh, the, these two artists were in the Biennale here. And um, the, the Japanese guy um, left my name uh, with uh, Sylvester? Post yeah, Postana. And um, uh, he said, oh, you know, these uh, Israeli artists, you know, I was teaching already in art school in London. He said, you should invite him. I didn't know Sylvester, I didn't know anything about it. I never been to Portugal before. So I, um, they invited me and I never forget the first day I arrived to Portugal. It was Saturday in August and it was raining in London. And uh, I was not really interested as much in the Biennale as much as the workshop. I didn't even come in August, was already the Biennale running for a month or so. I just came to do my own work in this atmosphere and leave it, just experiment for a week, 10 days. So I brought with me some tools and jigsaws. I landed in Porto Airport, which was smaller than now. And uh, it was sunny and beautiful, completely different than in uh, London. And then I arrived to the immigration. I had only Israeli passport that time. Now I have also British. I show the passport and the man said, where is the visa? And I said, what visa? He said, visa. I don't speak English, he says. I gave him the um, letter of invitation from the Biennale. I said, make, make a phone call to them. They're waiting for me, that is. He said, I'm sorry, not speaking English. Then after everybody gone, he said, come with me. I went with him. He saw a girl in a duty-free shop, 12 years old. She speak English. Maybe her parents live in England, or live with her or something. In the summer, she was working. She explained to him, he said, okay. He went to the other room, he made a phone call. He came back and he said to me, okay, come with me. I said, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. He took me back to the plane and two hours later, I was back to London. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I phoned the Biennale in the evening and I said, I'm really sorry, I'm not coming. They said, we know, he phoned us up and we tried to explain to him, we didn't help. So please get a visa and come back. So I said, um, I, I don't think I can do it this year anymore. You know, by the time I go, because I, I had to travel after that. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't come. Sure enough, they remember me. Two years later, they invited me again. This time I went and I got visa. I arrived to the airport, the same man with the mustache was there. I passed through him. I went to look for the girl, to see if the girl there, the 14 years old now, she was there with her parents, like nothing changed. I didn't know anyone. I, it was my first time in Portugal outside the airport, second time in the airport. I, took a train to Cervera. I arrived at night, I didn't know anyone. I had to look for the organizers, I had to look for someone, you know, from there. And they told me they were sitting in a restaurant, um, in a garden, 
belong to one family, which is now the tourist information office next to the camera. And I went there and there was one guy called George. He's an artist. I haven't seen him since. He spoke quite good English. And he was sitting there and I explained that I just came with my luggage and everything. And they were eating and they asked me to join them. And they had some chicken or something. And I said, I don't eat chicken, you know, I eat <coughs> fish, I eat a vegetable, I eat everything. Now I eat chicken. But that time I didn't eat, until now I haven't eaten meat more than 40 years. I don't eat meat. So chicken. And there was a man there sitting there, he explained to him, and he said to him, tell him to come from tomorrow for lunch and dinner at the Posadas restaurant. He was the director of the Posadas. And I thought, what a paradise, <laughs> what a place. I just arrived, everything organized, you know, I have uh, the best restaurants in the area. With, they had a fantastic restaurant. And every day I walked in the, um, next to the forum, there is a, a building behind, um, behind the school. Yeah, there is a Galicia, you know, the school. There, they, they used to, they have a big workshop, they store the, the tractors there and everything, belong to the municipal. They gave me a space there and I started working. And every lunch I used to go, take shower quickly, change my clothes because there were tourists and people, I can't go like this, you know, with overall and everything, and twice a day, eat alone. The other artists, there were a few artists from Germany and from Holland, from this, they were getting a Scudos that time, it was a Scudos to, to, to buy lunch and dinner. At the end of this, I got to know many people in no time. I made the first piece I did for that uh, Biennale was a big egg shape with a little monkey. That time I learned the word macaco. There's a little macaco holding this big egg on top, on top of the head. And we plan, I put it where now is the car park of the camera, behind the camera. And uh, plaster, you know, put, put uh, cement and color and everything. And I supported it with uh, wood. And I said, give it five days to dry, then move the wood. And then I went back to London. The next day, two days after, I got a phone call. Can you come back? I said, what happened? Some people at night, kids, drinking and think they probably belong to their parents, uh, live in France or wherever. They kick the wood the first night, the sculpture fell, and it's been everybody upset. It's been on local television, it's been on the news, it's been in the, you know, in the local, com the lo local uh, communication, and everybody talk about it in the town. The police said they prosecute the parents if they, or the kids, if they're not going to bring you back to do the work. I said to them, I have four days because I had to go to New York, and I said, I cannot come for 10 days again. I only, Come, can come for four days. So these four days, if you can bring me professional people to help me, like welders, you know, uh, plaster, builder, something, no problem. When I was there, I told Georges, before I left first time, that I can do some magic. And he said, you can do magic? I said, yeah. He said, why don't you do? I said, I didn't bring anything with me, you know, like cards and things. He said, if you do magic here, you'll be like a saint. You know, you see in every corner they have a saint or something. <laughs> you know, they never seen anything like that. You should do that. So this time I brought some stuff with me. I said, four days, but maybe. Now, I become very famous in Cervera without being, knowing that, without being there. The last two days that I was in England, everybody talked about it. I arrived to the airport. Completely different than last time. This time, two cars waiting for me. Each one was fighting who will I go with. 
you know, one car from the BNR and one car from the camera. And because I had friends in both. And they decided we stop in Vienna in the middle. And I'll go with one of them. And then we stop in Vienna. We'll have dinner. That was Saturday night. And after that dinner, I will swap the car and have the honor to go with the other one. I said, OK. While we were sitting in the dinner, I did some magic trick. Wow, you must, you must have a show. I said, what a show? I only show one, two friends. You know, I'm not that professional. No, 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 you must have a big show. I arrived, they made posters, they announced in the radio, they did this, like a big professional one, and they were going to have it. You know, with the library, now they used to have a big hole there, and it's going to be there. So I said, OK, on one condition, it will be 11 at night. And people were all night in the summer in Cervera. And everyone will get a glass of wine free, you know, when they enter. I don't drink, I drink wine, but not much. You know, one glass or two is good enough for me. And then I thought maybe people would drink one glass of wine, they'll be a bit tipsy and it will be helping, it will be easier for me to, you know, to do the magic tricks on them. They didn't realize it's nothing, it's like drinking Coca-Cola here. <laughs> one glass is a joke. In no time, they were, when I arrived, yeah, the first day, the next day, uh, one waitress came to me and he said, the director of the Posada is very upset with you. I said, why? Because you didn't come back to the restaurant. I said, I was not invited. I did not know. I didn't push myself. No, no. It's his honor. You come back. So I came back to Posada in the evening. Absolutely packed. Hundreds, you know, all the chairs, everything. And they, they were like kids from four or five years old to 130 years old widows, <laughs> you know, women. Everything was there and was standing and thing, and there was a stage, and there was a guy from local TV, and uh, he was also interpreter, and a program of 10 minutes, 20 minutes, went for one hour. You <laughs> know, because of the, I asked people to come, I like this, and for the first few BNR, I was known as a magician. <laughs> not as a sculptor. So that's how I arrived. Since then, they invite me every two years. And uh, not every two years I could have come. And um, whenever I could, I came. And every time I did another sculpture and left it here. And uh, most of the sculpture were small to be for indoor. Uh, at one point, when they were at the forum, they had one room only of my work, you know, permanent collection, like a horse, like another figure. Um, so that's how I arrived first time. Like a, uh, as a magician. Yes, very nice. Uh, yeah, I arrived as a sculptor. I, uh, yes. I ended up as a magician. <laughs> I carry on as a magician and I'm back to be a sculptor. So uh, when, um, before we start this interview, you are uh, telling us that your father, I, I, I don't know uh, this before. Jula. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's very uh, curious because I, I want to ask you that is a um, that is a Portuguese uh, technique uh, filigrana. Yeah. And sometimes uh, the first time I, I saw your work, um, I thought that the, maybe filigrana uh, the technique is something yeah. about. Uh, okay, related. that's a good, very good question. Uh, my father. Uh, um, I was born in Yemen. I came as a few months old, and my father was um, a jeweler in Yemen since he was a kid. You know, like with his uh, uncle, or because his father died when he was young. And they were very known for the filigree work. So he is one of the best, if not the best, you know, um, a filigree worker in uh, Israel. I have, I have a book here, actually, a book published with his work, I can show you. Now, when I um, went to art school, until I went to art school, I didn't want anything to do with that. 
I'd never done jewelry, I didn't want, and he used to teach people also, and he worked in this famous company, he was a director of the design, jewelry. The guy also, even though he was doing filigree, um, and he never studied in art school, it came from a town in the desert. I went to visit Yemen 25 years ago, it's middle of nowhere. And um, he started doing contemporary and modern design with his work and he won prizes also for that. And later on he combined, combined modern and old. And then um, he's back to uh, traditional now. Now, I never wanted to do that. I was not interested because for me jewelry restricting me because it's functional. It's for the hand, it's for, you know, and I want to be free. I didn't want anything to, I went to art school because I wanted to be a painter, not a sculptor. I didn't, never done sculpture in my life. And um, then at the end of uh, first year, I needed some money. So to finance my following year. So I went to my father and I said, I want to work in the summer to do some jewelry. He said, look, I'm not wasting, I'm, I, I don't want to waste your time or my time. Uh, I don't like these people who just do with pliers and things. If you want to do something, you need to solder, to you know, learn how to weld and everything, and then you do the work. And then I give you professional work that you'll have to do to the company where I'm working for. I said, okay. So he taught me, it was very quickly, and I started in no time, within a few weeks, to produce work like a professional to his uh, company, to the company he worked for. And then I started doing my own design also. I did about four or five jewelry that look very sculptural, you know, like three dimension, and they come from nowhere, you know, like uh, uh, brooches and things. And, um, and then I started, I got some money, and then I was offered by an ex-student of my father who went to art school to join her to start teaching uh, in high school in evenings uh, classes in jewelry. So I did that with her in Jerusalem while I was a student, and then I, I had my own course in uh, uh, other villages on the way to Jerusalem, which I conducted, but that was the last time that I did. When I went to art school, my work was completely different. The first few years also when I went to... I studied in art school in Jerusalem, the best art school, which is four years course. After two years, um, I, was, I got the highest degree in the class every term, second year in sculpture, and then I got the lowest as an average, which shocked me. I didn't really understand where that come from. I thought it was a mistake, and um, I found myself kicked out after two years. I never finished art school, and the best art school is 100 years old, 120 years old school. So a friend of my father, um, saw me painting, he was a sculptor living in England, saw me painting since I was a kid. He said, if one day you would be interested in sculpture, come to work with me. So I came to work with him. And uh, I asked him if he did, and uh, I worked with him as a sculptor for a few months. And then I felt that I want to go back to school. I, my English been blocked, completely forgotten. I couldn't even ask, how are you, without making five mistakes. Completely forgotten, and culture shock, everything. Uh, so he went as interpreter uh, with me to the nearest university. We live near, between London and, and Oxford. In Reading, I was accepted there, and I did part-time, short-time. Uh, uh, two days a week, the first term, 
And after one term, I said I want to move back to university. I, I feel like I want to carry on my study. So I did one year without knowing what I was who I, I was belong to. Second year, third year, postgraduates, nothing. I did whatever I wanted, used to come, wake up early in the morning, six o'clock, learn from book. I'm, I'm a boy, I'm not a girl, there's a plane, there's a train with pictures with this, and memorize, you know, and, and, and getting everything back to me, you know, all the English come back. And, and uh, in one year, I managed to do something like four years in terms of enough work. And at the end of the year, the head of department said to me, you should, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going back to Israel. He said, I think you should do master degree, either in America or in London. I said, but who, who would take me? You know, I don't, I, two years and I kicked out. This year, I, not even, I did what I want. I, I wasn't belong to anyone. And I don't have the BA. And then one day came uh, head of school from Chelsea, one of the best school there, and of, of a postgraduate, saw my work, and uh, he was giving me criticism. And then he knew about me from the director, and he suggested, he said, I think you should try St. Martin School of Art. They have a very good course, um, 12 students, and six teachers, and they're all very known international artists. And I think you have a chance. It's like postgraduates, you know. And I, I, said, I told him the same thing, and he said, look, I'm head of department. I take exceptional. I'm sure they would take exceptional too, if you fit. Okay, I told the department. The next day I was already there for interview. And I was like this, because I knew all these people, even from Israel, from art books and everything that they were teaching. Antoni Caro, all these people. So I came there, the head of department, shake my hand, sit next to him, look at 400 photos that I brought, because I was working like crazy in a small sculpture. And then he said, how are you going to finance your studies? I said, it's my last problem. Uh, first to accept. He said, it's your first problem. He called the secretary after five minutes. He said, um, enroll him. He saw that I was excited. He said, you will be good. And I came there. Half of the students already had master degree. They come from Columbia University, from Sydney, from London. From... I'm the only one that had like three years and also nothing. To cut the story short, I ended up offered after a year to teach. Same department with my teachers. So I taught five years. Um, two days, one day a week or something gave me enough money to live the whole week. And that's how I started my career. But the work that I did that time to answer your question about jewelry, as soon as I left school, in the school, I was doing this abstract metal work that follow uh, Antoni Caro and all the teachers are doing, because I wanted to learn that language. Um, there were some of them, some of the teachers were working on intuition. You don't need to have idea. And some of the teachers were opposing them. You have to have idea with the sculpture, and I had both, and that's why it was more successful than others. And um, a, as soon as I left the school, I said, I don't want to follow my teachers. You know, I learned the language, but I can use it, but I want to deal with things that concern me. And. I started walking, you know, started noticing things that I did not notice before when I came to England. You come from different culture, culture of restraint, everything has to be this, and you come from very expressive place and thing. And suddenly I see I walk in Oxford Street, for instance, you know, it's near the art school, high street, and you see big tree planted, not on the ground, on a big pot from concrete. 
in a pot of concrete, big tree cannot even breathe. Why not to put on the ground? And these kind of things started forming my philosophy. I started working with logic, uh, design, uh, things that opposing intuition, feeling. So the nature for me was the most natural thing and represented feeling. The uh, pot was coming from the head, was kind of logic, was design, was something, but it was suffocating it, you know? It was not, couldn't breathe. And so the work, the, my first installation was a forest of concrete columns with dead trees that I found in a park. That's how it started. Found material and I used to make pile of them, take photograph of them, recycle them and move on. For seven years I was not interested in commercial galleries, only public galleries. Only in the mid 80s, when the time that I came here, I already, I just about to start with commercial gallery. But that time when my father was looking at the work, the abstract, pile of stones, pile of wood, you know, nothing. He never told me it's ugly or it doesn't make sense or it's no good. They always supported what I do, but he didn't speak to him. Over the years, I started changing, you know, the, the, this kind of abstract thing went to a more realistic and concrete thing. Like I started using forms, objects, and animals, and all metaphorical to human attitude. And gradually, the, the human shape become the subject. And then it went to the flower, and all this artwork is to do with nature. I still with nature. I use the nature as a metaphor to my, uh, to human attitude, to human being. But it's not so much about flower, like that installation with the flower, I don't know if you saw, that I brought to the Biennale and, and won the first prize, is maybe I know five names of flowers, 900 different species of flowers in 27,000. That was the last exhibition in Japan. 27,000, you enter the room, you see a black field, you go to the other side, you see, it's in fire, you see it's in color. So it's very mental and emotional work, and that's what concerned me. And just to give you an example, I chose flower because flowers are symbol that is given in a very happy moment and very sad moment. So it can work on both sides. Okay, um, but you think your technique it's near to the filigrana, to the filigrana, or not? <coughs> the technique, um, not really. I, I tell you uh, why. The only thing is the cutting. My technique is I insist on hand cut of the work, uh, but the result can be look the, the same. But the technique itself, I know in jewelry you also cut very thin um, saw and blades, uh, very delicate, you know, images and or forms. But in this one, the, the bigger, even the large sculpture that I make, uh, they cut by hand. It was in metal, metal, metal of Vienna or aluminum, cut with a jigsaw. I insist on cutting by hand for several reasons. One reason, it's retain the feeling of drawing, the sh shaking hand. It's important because I done about two, three sculptures in laser and laser, um, you have to program it. So every curve, every line is broken. You have to have it uh, computerized, 
analyzed, and also it cut in 90 degrees and very smooth. So you can see the thickness. Um, with cutting by hand, especially with plasma machine, metal, I hold the torch and I can change the angle, let's say 60 degrees, 45 degrees. So when you stand in front of the sculpture, you don't know how thick it is. You don't see the sides. You think it's thin like paper. Only when you move around, you start seeing the thickness. And that's also important to me. Not only just the hand cut, it's important that you will concentrate in the image rather than in the actual uh, structure. Like if you make a hole and you see the side, it's not a hole. Or the hole becomes much, much smaller. So this technique is like the old technique but uh, has the best result for what I want to do. So, uh, you are a um, world citizen? I'm yeah. what? A uh, world citizen. You are a citizen from, from the world. You was born in Yemen. You live in Israel, now in London. Do you feel that this kind of uh, experience around the world is important um, for the way that you look uh, for the other people? Um, what I'm uh, trying to ask you is that when you work in the, this big series, uh, people I saw and never met, this uh, experience, this group of experience that you have around the world is important for you? Do you feel yeah. you are like yeah. a man yeah. from the world? Or There's do you no... feel that you are from a place in specific? No, from one hand, I would say that wherever I take myself, the idea are, are there. You know, I can be in a small room in different countries and the ideas would be one idea, follow the others. So I cannot be affected by landscape, for instance, or certain people I meet. But at the same time, because I travel a lot, I have quite a lot of exhibition around the world. I meet different people. In every country, I have friends that some of them I knew before, and most of them I met during my installation. And now, working, visiting this country is not like a tourist, because I have to install the work. So I have to, to work there and to feel what other people don't experience when they are tourists. How people work, how people live, you invite to their home for dinners, for this, they work with you. And you find the basic thing that you find that people are the same. They have love, hate, similar emotion, everything. They might have different religion, you know, different culture. But for me, they are the same. And that's where the installation, people I saw, but I never met. I, in that installation, I put people that I saw from distance. I never went to see specially people for my project. It's wherever I went, I had camera, I look in the camera, I turn my head and click, and they are inside. People that I saw, they don't even know that I photograph them. They don't know that, and that's give the most natural act in their face. And the um, interesting thing is that wherever I show this, it got different interpretation, local interpretation. I um, showed it first time, second time, First time, I think, was with 2,000 in uh, Sydney, and then second time was already bigger, 3,000 in Los Angeles. And it was in March 2017. This is an ongoing project that started in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, uh, taking photos but not showing it, in 2015. Then I had a... Um, when I showed it there, Trump just got into become president. He started January, two months before. 
and he was talking against the immigration, against the Mexican, against the refugees, against everyone except him. And in the paper, in the reviews, they start seeing the political aspect of it, the social aspect. Because you have a field, you have the same ground, all sand, and you have small figures from 20 countries so far with their costume, with their dresses. You can tell almost, you can tell who is Japanese, you know, who's from Indonesia, who is Muslim, who is European, and who is African. And um, they're all the same distance, the same level. Same level, maximum 20 centimeters. In between them, a selection or some larger one just to and it's randomly it's not I want to do this big or something it's just random now uh, it's I think uh, it was interesting to many people it showed this kind of equality and humanism you know then after Braganza three months later after the Sean Braganza a year ago, the show was uh, open in um, Siberia, in Russia. Now, I went there to see the space first. So I've never been to Siberia. I went early summer and the show was open. It was in Biennale they had in September. The problem was it's a museum that opened in 87 um, on the name, after the name of Lenin. Three, four years later, Soviet Union dismantled and Lenin was irrelevant. But they made a big sculpture in the best space inside the museum, few meters of bronze, Lenin, his wife and three comrades. You know, three revolutionaries with him and they couldn't move it. And it's the space they offer me, which is half of the Biennale was in one space and half of the Biennale was the, my installation. And it was the best space, but it stuck in the middle, almost. So they told me you can either cover it in a box or um, have it um, leave it, you know, in, in your installation, exposed. So I went to see it a few months before, and I realized that there's a gap between the legs, that you can see the continuity. I said, leave it, don't cover. And it was the biggest installation so far, with 5,000, bigger than Braganza and 20%. 25%. And Vaganza was 4,000 figures. And it was at the same time. I duplicate some of them, but not the big one. The big one was original in each one. And the communication uh, in terms of aspect, uh, they looked at it completely different again, also politically, whether it was criticism, whether it was on TV or written or interviews, they saw Lenin looking at the masses, very, very small masses. So that's the communism. So, and recently with the coronavirus that we have, you might have seen it in Facebook or something that I did. Um, there was a demonstration in Tel Aviv uh, and the people has to stand two meters from each other. Otherwise they wouldn't get permit for this. And somebody in the, one of the best paper in Israel, definitely the most intellectual, the guy was standing on high rise building, photographer, and took photograph from above. And it looked just like my installation. The virus don't tell between people. 
they all look the same. Suddenly, same flood, same size, all from same distance, like I do, same distance in the installation. So people start writing to me, hey, it's like your installation. They never saw it. I never showed it in Israel yet, but they saw the image. They saw it in my Facebook. So I put two photos, one photo of the demonstration and one photo of my work. Um, and from, I think from Los Angeles or something. And you could see the similarity. And I think this aspect of the coronavirus that doesn't tell between culture, religions, everything, unified, united the world. Against, against, In a way, like, yes. like what I was trying to say. Everybody say, oh God, you were like a prophet. Everybody was writing this. You could have seen it. I said, what do I see? It exists. It's only in your head is different. It's always there. It's always been there. I didn't change anything. Do you think art uh, should uh, always have uh, a political message? No. I don't, I don't think so. I think um, art should be, uh, artists should be very sincere and um, very much close and loyal to his own truth. And when he's doing that, he can speak to everyone. And um, I believe that if you go just for the political aspect, it's dated. The next day it can be different. You understand? But you can talk about the ideas and the ideology and the things behind and things that have kind of eternity look to them. Something that can last long because politicians change and change their mind. Why start following politicians? You understand? And I think the social aspect can be stronger than the other political one. But the message is important in art. The, the message is important. important. I tell you, I personally, until 10 years ago, I never thought that art, as an artist, art can solve anything, any problem. I never thought that. I thought we can only present question every time deeper or different angle, you know, show the problem. But we cannot solve problem. Until one day when I did the installation Blackfield and it was shown in, um, when it was shown in Australia first time, a man came to me and he was in tears, a young man. He so it touched him emotionally. So I thought, okay, you know, maybe the guy is very sensitive or something. And then I come across it more than once. When it came to Los Angeles, it has a huge impact. Um, in three days, it went into Facebook of some website, and it went again 1.3 million viewers. And then Art Forum, magazine, very famous, you know, magazine, start taking it to their website. And in no time, it, it's now it's 1.6 or 7, I didn't uh, show it. And thousands of reaction, you know, I, I, I can't even read at all, you know. And uh, uh, sharing and everything spread all over the world. Because of that, I had interviews and written about it in Turkey, in Russia, in China. They never seen it. They only saw images. In Japan, in New York, a couple of them. And it just show you how much, how much effect it can have on people, even as an image. They saw the video. The video was 60 seconds. I told the guy who was working in the gallery, I said, move your ass sit on a chair, somebody will push you and take a video of this. It took 59 seconds, 60 seconds, 
put it and then it was like crazy. Now one day I had a phone call, I was in Israel at the time, from the director of the gallery and she said to me, there's a, an old man that he kept coming here and um, he'd been five times and he asked if he can call you, if I can give his number. I said, of course he can call. The man called me and he said, I want to tell you a story. He was a Jewish guy. I want to tell you something that I experienced recently. I have a friend, <clears throat> she's very old. She came as a young woman from Europe to America. All her family died in the Holocaust. She came alone. She met a man, she fell in love and married. And all her life she was with him very, very close. A month ago, he died. She wanted to die. That's all she had, all the love to the man. And she wanted to finish with her life. He said, I tried to persuade her to come and see the installation. She refused. In the end, she came after a few weeks. She saw the black side, black field. Then she walked. She saw the color. She sat down and she didn't stop crying. And I just want to tell you that the last two weeks, she's happy, she's out, she finished with that. And that was very touchy, emotional. And for me, I couldn't believe that an artwork can have effect on anyone as such, you know, that can change life. And uh, that's a reward. If it can help one person. In, in 2018, uh, year, uh, the Biennial uh, made uh, an exhibition in the Parliament, Portuguese. I, I think I told you about that. And uh, um, I chose two pieces from you. Uh, from two very special places uh, in the building. The building is a very historical building and it's not easy to make the exhibition because we have a lot of ele other elements. But I, 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 I choose that man and um, uh, I think it's from the 19th. It has like dots. Yes. Uh, yes. In the end of the 19th maybe. Uh, yeah. And I put it in the... Um, in the end of the stairs, uh, with the four other sculptures. I saw the photo. Yes, I didn't see the show. and they are communicating. Yeah. And the man is looking to another sculpture of a girl with a um, with a gun, and to a José Rodríguez sculpture and another one. And I have a lot of problems with the, the protocol because they think that I am trying to tell that the um, the girl. Uh, that is a feminist message, and the girl is l like putting a gun to, to, to the man, and I have a lot of problems with the protocol, but okay. And in the main room, I, I, I put the, the two pieces of the black field that we have in the collection, and uh, in, in the middle of the room, I put a, 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 a piece of art of Alberto Vieira, uh, Casa Tank, uh, that is, it's like... Um, Tank, the tank, uh, and and the house. Do you know that that, that it's like yeah, a yeah. a war tank, and yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah. a it's an house. Yeah. And the uh, the, ex the exhibition uh, opens in the 25th April in our uh, revolution um, party, <laughs> uh, and um, uh, Elena Roseta, that is an important. Uh, uh, politician of Portugal told me that, I never forget, I think I never told you, that Alberto Vieira, um, it's like the past, uh, the, our old uh, war, okay, we are fighting for freedom and your uh, work, it's like uh, our uh, war from today, the ambient war, the environment war, the the climate changing and everything, and uh, they, uh, she told me that, and he, he, she also started crying. 
because I think in this room you have two artworks. What was the, the other one? Do you remember? Uh, Horse? No. No. Uh, it's black field. The flowers. Yeah. The flowers the black field and in a box. In a box, ah, and okay. in the stairs, it's the it's a man. Yeah, the man made of dots. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and she told me, I think you you, you are uh, the artist. You are trying that uh, our wars are always uh, changing, but but it's always about um, about about the planet and about the problems of the planet. And I think I, I never told you that that black field yeah, I, that I, impact. I showed in last year. I'm, I'm interesting. You said that last year. I show in China, in Beijing and Shanghai, in exhibition about Save the Planet. Yes, it's a very important That was the theme. The same curator, she did two different shows. She took the, the, the flowers. She liked the flowers, but also other work of mine relating to that. You know, the butterfly, the other things. And, but uh, it's interesting because it also have that kind of aspect on it. In the other part of the, of the world, it's like a... And um, I, I tell you, it's quite interesting, something local. Um, I never showed until 2007 in the Biennale. I've been coming here like 30 years, 40 years, always after the Biennale opened. I wasn't interested in the Biennale itself as much as in the workshops around it. And every time left school. And then, 2007, I show first time the flowers. I had 3,000 only flowers, and I show it in London in a gallery. And Margarita happened to be there that time, and she came to I invited her to the opening, and I knew her already before. She came, she saw this, and she said, "Tado, I really want this to be in the Biennale." In in a couple months, you know, in the Biennale. I said to her, I'm already uh, participating in a group show in London. After this show, it will be taken down. Uh, and I promised them, you know what? I split it. 1,500 will go to Cervera and 1,500 will stay in London. I'll make smaller, smaller instead. Say, so, okay. But to fill the room, maybe I'll make boxes. Yeah? Also, I added boxes. We showed it that time in Caminia. You saw the yeah. exhibition. Now, it's a small museum, that archaeology or something. I did that on the floor. Now, they, I was at the opening, and the person, I don't know if you were there, but they, um, President of the camera, there was a woman, she opened the show. And she was speaking. I didn't understand everything, but people explained to me, translated. And she said that when she came to the room and she saw the black side of the plant, she was so shocked. Because it reminded her what happened a year before, where all the forests around were under fire, and it came to the closest, close to houses in Caminia. And after that, the mountain was black, you know, with burnt trees, and that's what she saw. And when she moved around, of course, when she saw the color, she saw the future, she saw another season, everything. And it was beautiful speech. Because she started by saying, I don't know much about art. But definitely she knows about life, you know, like everyone. And that's where it's come from. And this part also ecology. This aspect. Yes. I have two more questions, uh, maybe different ones. What's your relation with God? With? with God. With God? I don't think I have a relationship, you know, with God, as you know what Woody Allen said once. He says, um, you ask me if I believe in God, try to get a plumber on Sunday, you know? That's really hard. But I was brought up 
still my parents, are uh, religious people. They're not fanatic, but they're religious. If they were fanatic, we were five children, I'm the oldest, we would all be religious by now. I went to religious school when I was six, the first year of studying. And when I was seven, I was already out of this school. My father and my parents took me out and put me in other school, not religious at all. Years later, I asked my dad, what happened? Is it because the school was very far and I had to walk? And he said, no. I met the rabbi of the town and we started talking about the kids. And I was proud to say that you were in the religious school of the town. It's a small town. What that time was 10,000 people. Now it's 50 near Tel Aviv. And the rabbi says, and I asked the rabbi, he said, if his kids are in the same school. And the rabbi said, no, they're in the next town, which is bigger. So I went back home and I started thinking, why they are they to travel to another town? Probably that this school is not good enough for you, even though it's religious. So I waited till the end of the year. I moved you out. For me, it was important you grow up as you have a good education. But as to religious and traditions and this, you can get it at home. I can show you at home. So I have big respect to my parents, um, to their religion. I wouldn't do anything that can hurt them. And they have a respect to me that I'm, uh, I remember that I'm not observant. I remember my father coming first time to London many years ago as my guest. And the telephone rings Friday evening, which is Saturday, like Sabado. And you're not, if you're a religious person, you're not answering. You're supposed to rest that day. And I didn't know what to do. It was a small apartment. We are in the living room. My telephone ringing, landline, there was not uh, this. So my father said, why you don't answer? It's not for me, he said. Oh, yeah, I know it's not for you. You don't know anyone in England. He says, why don't you answer? I said, out of respect to you. You know, he said, look, you're not a religious person. If you don't answer, it wouldn't make you a religious person. You know, it's for you. It wouldn't make any difference to you if you answer or not answer because you're not religious. So answer. And that kind of attitude, you know, liberal in one hand. So as a kid, I was brought up, you know, observing, believing in God and all that kind of thing. And I think over the years, um, you're going a bit far out of this. I feel like um, the man that was climbing a mountain. But this man, all his life, he was anti-God. He was telling everybody, God doesn't exist. God doesn't exist, you know. And he was telling everyone, stop believing in God, stop this, this. And one day he climbed a mountain and he fell. And the last seconds, you know, he managed to get hold of a bush and he was hanging up on a valley, you know, deep valley, canyon. And he started screaming, oh God, God, please help me, God, God, oh, I'm hanging. So a voice came up from there and they said, God, eh, you believe now in God, help me. Do you believe in God? Yeah, of course I believe in God. Do you trust God? Yeah, of course I trust God. I said, okay, are you sure? I trust God. Okay, let it go. Open your hand, let it go from the bush. What? You trust God, let it go. Can I, can I speak with somebody else up there, you know? <laughs> A sadistic one. You understand? So, God is in you. 
I believe. You know, uh, we have all those moral questions, ethical questions, between don't do to your friend or to anyone else something you don't want people to do to you, you know, to be done to you. And that's it. That's all, you know. So, and, uh, my next question. As I told you, I, I visit Israel and uh, Palestine uh, last year. And I, I, when I was there, I'm, I think that when I uh, saw uh, Zadok, I want to ask him what he think about this thing in, with uh, Israel and Palestine. What do you think about this conflict, about this situation? Yeah, what, what I think, you know, I, as a person who himself was a soldier, because everybody in Israel has to, to go to the army. Uh, when you are 18 until 21, you don't go to university until before you are 21, and girls has to do a couple years. Um, I went through this. I was even participating in a war, and I was lucky to survive. I was a fighter, paratrooper. And of course, the war can change your life. It's a question of survival from one hand. Um, but you can't survive on somebody else's misery. There's a plenty of space there for everyone. And we should split the country, give the Palestinian a state. They can conduct their life the way they want. And we have enough room for us. And um, um, I believe that this is the best solution. Any other solution is occupying other people, make them misery, depend on you, you become superior, and it's make you corrupted person, you know? Because there are people like you, even if they have different culture or religions, there are people. They want to live in peace, everyone. And unfortunately, we are in the hand of politicians that uh, want to stay in power, and they would do anything to stay in power. And they can persuade many people that this is the right things to do. And people vote for them. I mean, I can't just leave it to politicians, because everybody has a choice to vote for someone else. And they don't do it. And it's, I'm very sad to see the way that Israel is going now, the direction. Because um, if you don't share the land now, it's getting too late already. Because you get more and more settlement, it's more difficult to move settlements to one country or another, or to give them as much. And uh, eventually, you'll have to be in one country. And to be in one country means that the Palestinians, the Arabs, should have equal rights. Otherwise, you are like South Africa. And we don't want to be like that. So you have to decide. Either you have one country with Arabs that maybe there will be majority in no time because they have bigger birth rates and, and they have also several million. And so you end up living in Islamic State or another Middle Eastern state. Or alternative, you don't give them the right. And how can you live? You'll be a master of other people's life. You can't live like that. And therefore, they should split the country as soon as possible. You know, after 67 war, nobody believed that this land would last more than a few months that we stay. Now is 53 years. Israel was existed 19 years before with a much smaller space. And what? Now you triple it because Sinai and everything are added another 40% now. 
We don't need it. We had it in our hand. We said, for peace, we will do anything. You had the chance to have peace. So why did not you bring it back? And that's one of the religious aspect of it, unfortunately, that people believe that they are specially chosen, every religious, you know, the Jewish thing, the Muslim thing, the Christian thing, that the Messiah come when the Jews become Christian and these things like that, all of them. The religion brought more agony than happiness to the world. If you are individual and you believe, stay, believe, but don't involve it in politics. What land got to do with religion? You know, let's go to spiritual thing. It's not a concrete thing, it's material. That's why your work is so important. Uh, Sorry? That's why your work is so important because the, the people I saw and never met, for example, is about this. We are all same. Yeah, this is why I'm carrying on that. I started it five years ago and I carry on and carry on. I, actually, I have a lot of Portuguese here. Yeah. <laughs> because I take a lot of uh, photo here. Um, two weeks ago, I took from Cervera 300 photos. So this time, they will be with masks. Yeah, and then this, this is a, a lesson from COVID. We are all. Yeah. yeah, they all will be with masks. So I'll have several hundred people with masks next time. So thank you very much for this moment. You're very welcome.